now that we have understood what is the meaning of biodiversity how do we measure biodiversity what are the different kinds of biodiversity and all that next thing that we need to understand is how does biodiversity evolve how do we come to where we are currently how does one organism develop and rather the population of organisms develop in a manner that they have over millions of years so let me take some examples so that you will understand how exactly the things happen first example that we have is about mutation so what is the meaning of mutation first of all the meaning of mutation would be any kind of genetic change that you see any kind of genetic traits that has changed in a given organism for example because of certain changes you would see that color of the skin will change because of certain changes you might see that the color of the entire body changes in certain organisms and that is the precise example that we are taking here what you see here on your screen is basically peppered moth a very famous example in the scientific world what do you see are basically two traits and because of the difference in these traits and because basically of mutation what has happened is this normal color of the peppered moth so if you can see the pattern on the moth you will understand why it is called as peppered moth so if you just see the pattern what you see here in the second image is that it is black colored it's not a normal peppered moth but rather you can call it as a black peppered moth now what happened is normally wherever you see peppered moth they would lie on the bark of the trees and in the times of industrial revolution when it was first happening in london and the entire europe after that what we saw there was that these moths these peppered moths were found on the bark of the trees where there were a lot of lichens and these lichens are also light colored right so because lichens are light colored they are on the bark of the trees the peppered moth are also on the bark of the trees so because of that they were able to survive there very easily they did not get into the attention of many of the animals or the birds which would prey on them now what happened industrial revolution and what happened because of industrial revolution a lot of coal was being used both in the industries in the factories and in the homes what happened because of that black carbon soot and because of this black carbon soot what happened all this soot started to get deposited on the bark of the trees lichens lichens are also said to be environmental indicators right why indicators because they are indicators of change they will die off very quickly so what happened because of industrial revolution coal was being used a lot a lot of soot was being produced and because of the soot that was being produced the lichens on the bark of the trees started to die and as soon as they started to die the bark of the trees was now dark colored and because the bark of the trees were dark colored all these pepper moths which are light colored they were now very easily visible to the hunters to the birds or the animals which would feed on them so this population of peppered moth they started to die off but there was a mutation and this mutation was the black colored pepper moth now bark of the trees are dark colored as you can see on the second picture as well the bark of the trees are dark colored this pepper moth is dark colored it was able to survive because of this particular mutation so when you talk about the evolution of biodiversity mutation becomes a very important factor in helping an organism or rather the population of an organism survive so what would happen from here on is that the light colored pepper moth will not be able to survive but the black variant will be able to survive for a very long time for the generations to come and this is the manner in which mutation works so this is very important now there is the second manner and the second way in which the evolution of biodiversity happens is natural selection now natural selection is one term that perhaps you might have come across now when we talk about natural selection what do we talk about we basically are talking about the traits that might develop in the population of an organism which will keep going on which will be seen in the successive generations as well so we have two pictures again on your screens and what you understand from these two pictures are how the natural selection would happen first picture we are talking about the arctic wolf now when we talk about the arctic wolf generally what you will see is that the fur will be thick 
why the furs will be thick because they are in the polar regions they need furs to be thick to survive in such cold and harsh conditions now what will happen is there will be wolves where the skin or rather the fur will not be very thick when the conditions are harsh when the conditions are cold in such an environment what we will see is that the wolves which do not have very thick fur will not be able to survive for long maybe they will not be able to reproduce so the reproduction that will happen will perhaps happen from the wolves which have thick furs and because these have thick furs obviously the genetic trait of the thick fur will also get transferred to the next generation and to the next generation and so on so what will happen over a period of time is that all the wolves which have very thick furs will survive the ones which do not have thick furs they will not be able to reproduce they will not be able to survive and ultimately it will be a part it will be a genetic variation that will die off similarly the second picture that you see is the picture for camouflage and you might know the concept of camouflage what do you see for example you have four images here the first one is basically brimstone butterfly the second one is dead leaf butterfly this is a picture of bat fish and this is a picture of a bristern so what is common in these four pictures what you see is basically the brimstone butterfly just looks like a green leaf so they have camouflaged well into the environment in which they live so the predators or the hunters for these species will not be able to find them very easily similarly for the dead leaf butterfly also what you see is that this butterfly looks completely like a dead leaf so maybe many of the animals many of the birds many of the insects they will not be able to hunt for them because they don't know that they exist here third what you see is a bat fish something that lives under water now the skin the upper skin of the bat fish looks very similar to the surface of the sea floor and because it looks very similar to the surface of the sea floor they are not visible easily and again that's why they will not be hunted down easily and then when you look at the bristern or rather the american bristern again you can see that in the crop field they will be able to survive very easily so all these are basically examples of natural selection that because of the environment in which they live because of the environmental changes that their generations would have come across because of all these they have seen certain changes in their genetic makeup in order to survive in the environment in which they live so this is a kind of adaptation that has happened in all these kind of species so this is another way in which natural selection happens natural selection happens in another manner for example just talk about drug resistance what do we see in drug resistance why this topic has become such an important or so talked about topic nowadays what happens with drug resistance is that you take drugs which are not required or you take drugs which have been taken in much more amount than it was required so what happens then the bacteria or the microbe the pathogen that is there inside your body they will start to get accustomed to these antibiotics and once they start to get accustomed to these antibiotics they will start to develop a genetic trait in them which will help them in surviving now their reproduction happens very fast and since their reproduction happens very fast they will be able to survive these antibiotics very quickly by very quickly i mean maybe in 10 years or 15 years of time something similar happens with pesticides also we can talk about bt cotton what do we know about bt cotton we know that bt cotton was developed so that we can make a variant of cotton which will be able to survive the attack of ball worm right because ball worm will not affect bt cotton just know this but what has started to happen what we have started to see in last 5 years or so and many of the studies have shown this that bt cotton is being affected by ball worm now so ball worm over 15 to 20 years of time has been able to evolve it has been able to evolve in a manner that it will be able to feed on bt cotton because it is primarily dependent on cotton for its survival so for the survival or rather when we talk about the term survival of the fittest this is one of the concepts which needs to be understood very very well so now we are talking about survival of the fittest so that's why there is one more concept that you should understand that when we talk about natural selection when we talk about natural selection there are certain misconceptions also that we have for this term now when we say survival of the fittest 
what is the meaning of it do i mean that i am talking about the strongest individual or am i talking about the strongest population of organisms no we are not talking about the strongest we are talking about the fittest meaning that the kinds of organisms or rather the population of organisms that will be able to survive maybe in an environment which is hostile maybe because of the generational changes that needs to be brought in maybe because of the adverse effect that they have seen in their habitat so whatever be the reason they should be able to survive it and if they are able to survive if they are able to reproduce and have the genetic modifications or genetic mutations in them which is getting transferred to the next generation and to the next generation and to the next generation after that then in that case we can say that that was the fittest organism or that was the fittest according to natural selection so this is one point that you need to understand that survival of the fittest does not mean that we are talking about the strongest population but rather the population that will be able to reproduce the population that will be able to produce many more generations with genetic mutations which are able to survive according to the environment in which they are so this is one so i'll just write it down we are talking about misconceptions so another misconception that we have is that traits develop because they are required again this is not true traits don't develop because they are required many a times it can happen randomly many a times it can happen due to an accident let me take an example of giraffe a common misconception is that giraffes developed a long neck because they needed to survive on longer trees or the leaves of the trees that's not true what scientific research has shown is that in one of the previous generations what might have happened that there were certain uh, giraffes or certain individual giraffes which had longer necks and because they had longer necks they were able to survive very easily because they were able to feed on the plants and the trees which other organisms or other animals around were not able to so because of that this was one trait that gave them a competitive advantage and because it gave it a competitive advantage once it started to get transferred to the other generations this became a stronger trait because these giraffes were better giraffes as compared to the ones which did not have long necks so it did not happen because of the environment it just happened because it gave it a competitive advantage and because of that advantage these certain individuals were able to survive and that's why we saw that over generations giraffes developed in a certain manner so that's why this is another misconception that traits develop because they are required rather they change according to the external environment either because of the environment or maybe because of the competition that has been seen around so there can be various reasons for that then after that there is another very important misconception that you need to understand and that is a grand plan of nature many of the misconceptional theories think that there is a grand plan of nature that it is trying to naturally select the fittest it is trying to select the organisms whether plants animals microbes etc which would be able to survive which will be able to survive in a given environment or probably in the best environment that's again not the case it is just happening according to natural selection whether due to natural processes whether due to environmental issues whether due to human intervention whether due to a random accident a random genetic trait that developed so the reasons could be many so we don't know that why this is happening it could have happened for various reasons and we discussed what all reasons could have been there so that's why there is no such grand plan of nature that it is trying to make the fittest species there is nothing like that and there is no scientific proof to it so these are certain misconceptions that we have so that's why you have to understand the meaning of survival of the fittest for example if we talk about humans how did humans develop or how have humans become this let's say super species today that we are able to command many other species so to understand that there are certain things that you should know about humans and why humans became the species that we are today one thing is complex brain what happens because of this complex brain we are able to do multiple number of things i am able to speak in a language which is one of so many languages of the world so 
this is one example of the complex plane that we have been able to develop a better communication as compared to most of the other organisms. Similarly, you know that there are multiple things that we are able to do. Talk about the scientific research, the inventions, the discoveries that we have done. All that has happened. Why? Because of the complex brain that we have, which is not present in many of or rather maximum of the organisms that have survived. After that, one very, very important thing is the forelimb. That is our hands. So I am able to write with my hands. Not many species are fortunate enough to be able to do this. Rather, there is no one else or no other organism which is able to do this. So, the development of four limbs in a manner that we do not need our hands to walk, we do not need our hands to run, has been a very, very important uh, trait that humans have had, which has helped them to survive, which has made them this species that we are today. And then, after that, one very, very important thing, that you perhaps don't think of our thumb. Because of our thumb, we are able to grip the things properly. We were able to make the tools that made us survive when we were in competition with all the other animals in the early stages of our evolution. So because of the thumb, because of the thumb, we were able to grip. Because of the thumb, we were able to invent. We were able to make certain tools. We were able to eat. We were able to survive. We were able to make our clothes. Everything. And this we are talking about the evolution. We are talking about the early stages of development of Homo sapiens. So these kind of things and especially these three traits make us the species that we are today makes us the species which have been able to survive better as compared to many of the other organisms. But that does not say that we are the best organisms that have survived. Take a small example. What happened after COVID? What do we see after coronavirus came into the picture? All of a sudden, we did not have answers to something that is so tiny, something that is not even visible, that we have to take all the precautions in the world that is required just to survive, just to ensure that we don't die. So that's why we cannot say that we are the best species. We cannot say that we have been the pinnacle of the species. But yes, we have been able to survive better than most of the other species, right? But you need to understand that these three have been the foremost important reasons why we have been able to do so. Now, the next thing that we need to understand is that how does biodiversity come into the picture? What is the origin of biodiversity? Most of the times what has been observed is that biodiversity will come from an island. It will originate on an island or maybe a barren land. Maybe it will originate on an area that has been cleared due to a natural phenomena. It can be something like a volcano, an earthquake. It can be glaciations. There could be any of these reasons. Something that we have already discussed when we were discussing ecological succession. So this is the first step to biodiversity that we take into account. Then after that, what we see is that this speciation basically slows down. After a while, once the organisms have started to develop, there are mutations, new species are being formed. And after a while, there will be enough richness in the species. And then after that, we'll see that there is a kind of slowing down of the speciations. And ultimately, it will settle down into an ecosystem. And then finally, what we observe, the third thing that we have seen is that near the tropics or rather near the equator, as we move towards the equator, the amount of richness is higher. The species richness is higher, the biodiversity is higher and that's why you'll see that most of the hotspots of the world also lie in these kind of regions. The biodiversity of these regions, whether you talk about the Amazons or you talk about Africa, you talk about even the areas which are near the tropics, for example, our own biodiversity hotspots in the Western Ghats. These are few of the examples that you'll see that near the topics or rather near the equator, the biodiversity is much better as compared to when you go towards the higher latitudes. So this is something that we need to understand. So origin of biodiversity, three points that you need to understand. One, that most of the times it will be on a barren island or it will be in an area that has been cleared off. 
then after that after a while there will be a kind of stagnation that will happen and ultimately one more very important point that near the equator the biodiversity is higher even if we are talking about for example near the equators what we'll see is if you combine the two equator and island then in that case the bigger islands near the equators will be more biodiverse as compared to the smaller islands near the equator so i'll just write this point down if at all you are getting confused bigger islands near the equator would be more diverse as compared to the smaller islands in the same region so this is something that you should remember so these are few of the points about the origin of the biodiversity now we need to understand what are the sources of information about this biodiversity we are talking about some historic data that on the islands biodiversity developed near the equators the biodiversity developed after a while it started to become stagnant so all these kind of things comes from some of the historic data that we have and these sources of information basically come from two very important sources one the fossil information and second molecular evidence so first of all when we talk about fossil records or the fossil evidence what we know is that many of the historic data that has been collected many of the organisms that we know about today we know because we have the fossil records of them but when it comes to fossil records fossil records have never been the best source of information they have been a good source of information for what happened millions of years ago but at the same time you do not have let's say just a fraction maybe a few percentage maybe 5% or so i'm not giving you an official data i'm just making a statement that very small number of fossils are actually present today the reason let's say if we talk about something like a jellyfish if i talk about something like a jellyfish or let's say sea horse for example then in these cases what happened these are not organisms which are hard bodies meaning they don't have the bones as we have or the bones as most of the terrestrial organisms for example have so the fossils for these kind of organisms will not be that prevalent we would have to be very lucky to find a fossil of a jellyfish or any soft bodied organism any of the soft bodied organism because they will not survive for such a long time their fossils will not survive but if it was an animal which is hard body if it is a tree for example then in that case these would be the ones which will survive so that's why fossil records alone have not been the best source for the information regarding biodiversity then the second is molecular evidence this is where we go one step further and we try to look at the molecular evidence that we have for all these species that might have existed millions of years ago but even molecular evidence on its own is not good enough what we normally see is that we have to combine the fossil information and the molecular evidence at the same time to get a comprehensive information about the organisms about the populations that might have existed millions of years ago before any of let's say the bigger events like the extinction or the mass extinctions who might have happened so that's why normally whenever scientific conduct is done it is done on the basis of both being taken together that is the fossil records as well as the molecular evidence so what is the difference between the two sources when we talk about the fossils we are basically talking about the remains of that organism that you find somewhere or the other but when we talk about molecular evidence we are basically talking about the dna sequencing data that we have or the dna evidence that we have for a set of population for a set of organisms so that we are able to know how closely they were related or how they were able to let's say come from one generation to another how did they evolve all these kind of information comes normally from the molecular evidence or the dna evidence that we have for an organism so normally both these have to be taken together many a times these two do not agree at all for example you will see that the fossil records for many of the organisms will say something else and the molecular evidence will say something else so that's why combining these two data together becomes very very important when we look at the biodiversity and the evolution of species as it might have happened now this brings us to a very important question and a very interesting one how many species do we have in the world is there an answer to it for example if we just 
look at these two data. I'm just taking two examples. One which has been taken from the book, The Diversity of Life, which was published back in 1992. And then there was this journal, which was published in 2011. Now, if you just compare the two data, what do you see? You see that animals in both the cases have the largest share of whatever has been counted. Then you also have fungi, you have plants, you have protists and then you have bacteria. Bacteria if you see in both the cases account for not more than 0.4% and the recent data says not more than 0.1% perhaps. So when we talk about these things, we actually are not able to define how many species. For example, one of the estimates says that there are 1.5 million only insects out of these animals that we are counting. 1.5 million only insects exist and perhaps there are 2 million animals in total including all the insects. Then at the same time we also say that there could be billions of such species. There are some reports that say that there could be trillions of such species. One of the reports that were published in 2017 it says that there should be more than 2 billion species on the earth. So there is no data. There are people or there are researchers which are saying that there should be some million species and there are some data and reports which are saying that there should be more than trillions of species that are there in the world and whatever we have been able to identify until now is just the surface of the number of species that perhaps exist on the earth. Many of the species we don't know about because they are living in areas which we are not able to go to. They are living in areas which are far off they are living very deep underwater where we are not able to go and comprehend. So there are many, many reasons. There are many microscopic organisms which we are not able to gauge. And so all these reasons become the reason why we are not able to count the number of species. So if you just have to think about the reasons for why we are not able to count. The first is that many of the species exist in areas which are not gauged where we are not able to reach that becomes one reason secondly counting life is not easy counting life counting the number of species is not going to be easy and that's why you will definitely miss out on many of the species at the same time one very key factor is also if you remember we discussed the definition of species there are many ways to define species so since there are many ways to define species, there are high chances that many a times the same species gets different names and many a times different species get the same name. So at those levels also there are issues and there are problems that are happening. So because of all these reasons, it perhaps is not going to be easy for us to count the life on earth. We don't know how much life exists on earth and how much more we have not been able to name and number. All these kind of issues remain. Apart from that, there are species that are dying out without even us knowing about their existence at all. So there are so many things that are there related to this. So if you just talk about or think about the fact that what could be the number of species in the world, it perhaps is an uncountable number and it is something that remains very subjective according to the different researches, according to the different studies that have been conducted over many, many years. So that's why if you want an answer to this question that how many species are actually there in the world, there's no one answer. I mean starts from 2 million or in some studies let's say 10 to 12 million and it goes to some trillions according to some studies that have been conducted. So maybe right now we are not able to count and perhaps we will never be able to count. There will always be some estimations that will happen and that's why to give an exact number to how many species are there in the world is perhaps impossible for us. So just to summarize the points, just to summarize what is the problem. First, new estimates usually fail to take into account the previous work. Then after that, many of the species live in inaccessible habitats where we are not able to reach. Many of these past estimates use multiple different techniques to arrive at their estimates. Basically what happens is we know that, okay, data of past several thousand years shows this. So if I just extrapolate it to the next several thousand years, I would perhaps get the entire data. But since it is an extrapolation, it's not an original data. 
we cannot even say that this is the exact number and then again one fundamental problem as i discussed that we don't know or we don't agree to what exactly the term species means what could be the exact definition of the word species is another controversy that we run into and because of which we are not able to tell exactly the count of the species because we are not able to define what the species itself means so this is about the problem that we face in counting or rather how many species are there in the world now to conclude the topic of counting of biodiversity or the measurement of biodiversity let me ask you one more question before we move on to the next topic and that is is the diversity more on land or is the diversity more under water what do you think because if you try to think of it first of all when we talk about water we know that almost 75% of the earth is water right only 25% is land moreover we know that life started under water most of the organisms that you know that survive today on land they actually had started under water and then they started to evolve and they started to live on land right so these are two things that may support that may be oceans or let's say water in general might have more biodiversity might have more species as compared to land but that's not the case if you look at the figures you'll see that most of the researches will tell you something like this that almost 80% and in some cases the researches also say that approximately 85% of diversity or the number of species they belong to land most of them lie on the land only 15 to 20% of the total species number are under water what could be the reasons for it try to think of it one thing can be that when we talk about land we know that there are many different kinds of ecosystems that are there on land in darwin's words islands are hot spots of biodiversity even if you talk about two different islands the species richness of these two islands could be completely different right you can talk about something like a madagascar on one hand and you can talk about something like a britain on the other hand but when you look at britain and when you look at madagascar you know that the diversity or the kinds of species that are found in these two areas will be completely different that doesn't go for oceans for the oceans what we know is that there is no boundary now even if we are not talking about islands even if we are not talking about islands at all we still know that land has many physical boundaries for example take india you know that we start from the himalayas up north and west and after that we come to the plains then the plateaus and then we have the coastal areas and all these areas have completely different kinds of ecosystems and because they are completely different kinds i mean whether you talk about the temperature conditions the precipitation each and everything are very different you have the himalayas you have the plains you have the thar desert you have the islands that we have you have the coastal plains you have the plateaus so all these have completely different kinds of ecosystems and because of that the kinds of species that will be found in each one of them will be very very different if you compare the same to a water body you either have a sea or an ocean or you have a river system or any inland water system so the variations that you have in the water bodies is very less so that's why even if i talk about madagascar and britain where you have two completely different kinds of species on land if you talk about water in water you'll find that the kinds of species that are found will be very very similar because the conditions under water do not change much deep sea will always remain deep sea there will be no difference there the temperatures will be very low sunlight will never reach there the salinity will be very high all these kind of things will remain constant whether it is at the equator or whether it is in the temperate regions or the polar regions also for that matter so when you talk about conditions under water they do not change much but when it comes to land it changes a lot this becomes one reason then we can talk about insects we talked about insects that approximately if we have 0.5 million animals that have been listed until now we have at least 1.5 million insects that have been listed now insects again are one species that are found majority on land hardly you have any insect that is found under water so the species richness of insects that you have on land is far greater as compared to what you have under water so that becomes another reason that gives you a hint that the diversity on land has to be greater than what you see under water
let me give you one more example plants when we talk about plants you know that plants need photosynthesis to make their own food and to survive now this sunlight again if you go under water even if you are at the surface or just beneath the surface the sunlight is very low but as you start to go down as you start to go to the ocean floor you do not have much of sunlight and since the sunlight is almost negligible there because of that what will happen there will be no photosynthesis and since there is no photosynthesis that is happening deep under water the number of plant species that can grow in such conditions will also be very low and that's why again the plant richness if you talk about as compared to land under water it will be far lesser that becomes another reason for the lack of diversity under water one more reason when we talk about plants you know that whether you talk about bark of trees you talk about the leaves of a plant the you talk about the roots of the plants all these are separate ecosystems for many of the smaller organisms many of the insects many of the bees butterflies etc will feed on leaves on stems etc and there are many other organisms that live in the roots of the plants so this kind of diversity that is provided by the plants or the different kinds of ecosystem that they make on their own this is again something that is not really present in the water you can take an example of corals and you can say that corals also give a something of a similar kind of ecosystem under water but still when you talk about the amount of corals under water when you compare that to the number of trees that you have on land there is no comparison there so again because of that because trees itself i mean we are not even talking about a physical feature or completely different kind of an ecosystem we are just talking about a tree and how a tree itself can make an ecosystem we had discussed this in our first chapter also so this also becomes a reason why the diversity on land is far greater as compared to the diversity under water so just remember these certain facts with respect to this particular topic now this brings me to the end of measurement or the counting of the species that we have on the earth